now. I'm here with David Nin. Uh, David is Senior Director of Press and Publicity for Kino Lorber, a major North American distributor of uh, both American and international films. Uh, David, thank you very much for being here and answering my questions. Sure. I guess it's evening where you are or like late afternoon. <laughs> it is a bit later than we are, I guess. <laughs> but we made it work. That's what matters. Yep. Um, I'm here. I just woke up. <laughs> you, so this year you're a jury member for um, the ASVAF Fashion Film Festival, which is curated by uh, Diane Pernet for the 2021 edition. It seems that reading your, uh, your background, it seems that fashion and style have been quite an integral part of your career. You were a style and entertainment writer for the Dallas Morning News. You also worked for Seventeen Magazine. So can you tell me about your involvement with the ASVA Festival, with Diane Pernay and with fashion film in general? Well, I mean, I've been a fan of Diane's for a long time. Um, I worked in fashion in Dallas. People are shocked when they hear that. They're like, Dallas? Um, there's a lot of money in Dallas. Neiman Marcus is based in Dallas. JC Penney is based in Dallas. There's a lot of wealth there. Um, the women that live there take fashion very seriously. Um, so I think Texas, you know, D Dallas specifically had a fashion section with their newspaper. It was a full um, section that was even in existence, I think before the New York Times and LA Times had their fashion sections. I mean, they had a very dedicated staff who went and covered collections in Europe and, and um, New York and certainly maybe it was probably because of all the business with Neiman Marcus, you know, and luxury retail. Um, so in college, I thought, okay, well, I want to be a writer. What, what am I interested in? I was very interested in film, very interested in fashion. I had followed it growing up um, through all the 90s supermodel stuff. So that was really fascinating to me. And I was interested in it as a business. Um, so I intern there. And um, that led to a full-time job eventually where I was. That was my beat was to cover style, cover fashion, interview designers if they came through town. Um, a lot of major designers came through Dallas, Michael Kors, um, international ones, because uh, there's a, there, the business there is very vibrant with their luxury retail. Um, so I was going to Fashion Week, going to New York, kind of thinking, why am I not living in New York? How do I pivot? Obviously, I was been aware of Diane for a long time and her history as a designer and influencer, and um, you know just knew her as a fan. I didn't know her at all, <laughs> and then um, I met her. Either I think I met her in Cannes actually because my boss at the time uh, that I worked with at Film at Lincoln Center uh, knew someone that knew her, and then. Um, I met her in Cannes, but I also there was a Thanksgiving that I had spent in Paris that I was invited to, and she was at the Thanksgiving dinner. So I had Thanksgiving with Diane first. So that was like, I walked in and I saw her. I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is that kind of dinner. You know, it's like really nice. And, and I got to know her and, and, and we've had a friendship ever since then. Um, so I was in fashion for a while. I went to Seventeen Magazine because I wanted to work in magazines and see how that was like. And um, it's a tricky time for magazines because of, you know, online and the immediacy of online and the competition. And, um, you know, magazines need to be very, very innovative to survive today. And, you know, I thought Hearst was a great place to work. But then I also realized that part of what I really loved was film. And so I transitioned to a job at Film at Lincoln Center they're very renowned. They're the film department at Lincoln Center and they do international cinema, the New York Film Festival every year. Um, so I left 17 to go work there as a publicist. And that's kind of where my career just really took off in publicity and film. All right, so you you actually met at, at Cannes, which just goes to show how important <laughs> I think the Cannes Festival is. And it was quite oh, it is. heartbreaking it's to see it canceled last year. I know it's heartbreaking. We we love Can. I don't. I I was going at the time with Kickstarter because Kickstarter's um, 
team was trying to figure out how to work with producers from around the world um, to convince um, a lot of international producers and more why the platform could be advantageous for filmmakers. Um, and then I got to go to one of Diane's parties on a roof somewhere overlooking like the water and the yacht. And I was like, damn, this is amazing. And, um, and then, yeah, I, I, I wish she would come to New York. I don't think she wants to anymore, but she, if she does, I would take her out. But I think she's very tied to Europe and, and, and France. And so, yeah, we're really bummed about Cannes because in the pandemic, obviously we had films I'm at Kino Lorber now. So we had films that had played can and then we were releasing here in the United States when the pandemic happened. And then um, there were films that we bought out of can last year when they sort of had, um, they were official selections, but there wasn't a physical festival. Um, I worked on a really beautiful film called Slalom um, mm -hmm. by Char Charlene. Uh, Favier and it I just believe it's me playing that, France right now. <laughs> yeah, and it kills me that she didn't get to have her moment to do like the carpet and have thousands of journalists, you know, see the film at the Palais. Um, but, you know, we still release the film because we think the film is very important and beautiful. But I wish, you know, for filmmakers like her, it really um, was heartbreaking that they didn't get to do it because of the pandemic. It's been a tricky year for all of us. Yeah, COVID really affected many things uh, related to, to cinema. And I imagine that in distribution, you must have, you know, go, seen a lot of, uh, of change as well. I was wondering if you could tell me a bit more about uh, how Kino Lorber adapted to the pandemic. I read about Kino Marki, which was uh, basically uh, Kino Lorber's decision not to go the way of VOD platforms, but to have uh, what I think is called uh, virtual theatrical releasing. Can you tell me yep. more about this and generally how Kino Lober handled the, the pandemic? Sure. I mean, the pandemic happened. We were all running around. We had a major release um, that we of a film we bought from Ken Baccarau, um, Brazilian thriller. And um, everything was ready to go. The marketing, the PR, the appearances. They had flown to New York were Q&As and then the pandemic hit and we had some screenings we opened and we had to get them back to Brazil you know they were scared that they were going to be trapped in New York and everything was shutting down um, that second week of March while we were releasing this major film it was the biggest release that we worked on um, and you know as a business we had to really think about okay well what are we going to do everything's already kind of in place and do we just release it in digital? Um, you know, other companies were holding back dates for their releases and holding back films. And we went the opposite direction. Um, we thought people are home, they are trapped in their house, they're scared to go outside. How do we get their eyeballs on our work? Um, and we saw it as an opportunity. So I think the thing with virtual cinema was, you know, we work really um, closely with theaters, art house theaters in America, and they're very important to us, you know. Um, we want to maintain those relationships. We care about them, you know, and we knew that they were going to be struggling closing their doors. Um, there's just no option about, doubt about that. So our team um, decided to come up with a program called Kino Marquee, where, um, we work with art house theaters across America and even organizations. Uh, and it was about 400, originally it was 11, 11 theaters signed up. Film at Lincoln Center, a few here and there around New York and um, across the US. And then we, once we announced it widely to the theaters, they all thought that was an interesting idea. They, we split revenue with them. So let's say a film played on Kino Marquee and a certain theater sponsored the screening and did the marketing in their hometowns or their areas, they got half of the ticket sales. So um, we worked with the theaters to set up the pages for them where it looked like a marquee, almost like it would say like, 
the theater presents, you know, Baccarat, click here. So essentially it's digital, but the way we were branding it was um, as a virtual theatrical experience. You're experiencing a new movie, you're still attending a cinema in your home. Um, we tried to do a lot of digging in with the different theaters to really encourage them to market um, the film in, in their areas. And I dealt with local critics um, to get there to drum up their audiences. Um, it was successful. And, you know, the more the, the theater was pushing to their audiences to the virtual theatrical, the more money they made. So at least they had some kind of revenue stream because they were closed. And so we realized in order for it to be successful, we needed to get more, it, it allowed us to really dig into more films that maybe we hadn't looked at before. Um, take chances, you know, with films that might not have been on our radar. We did partnerships with other distributors who saw what we were doing and they saw that we had the manpower and the technology to set up and we would partner with distributors on certain films. Uh, Good Deed Entertainment was one, WellGo, um, who specializes in Asian cinema. And we would do a profit split with them too. So it was successful. I mean, it was over a million dollars. You know, that might not sound like a lot, but to a lot of small art house theaters that are getting a percentage of that, that was something, you know, to help them out. We still have it going on because theaters are not all fully open in America right now. They're open in certain markets and in certain markets like New York, they're at a certain capacity. So um, we're releasing in theater and the cities are open at a capacity, but we're still doing virtual cinema because frankly, there's some people that don't wanna go out and spend the money to drive to a theater, pay for the popcorn and watch a movie. They can still experience um, our films. And so we just as a company just really had to be scrappy and pivot and figure out how are we going to make money? How are we going to support these films? How are we going to release these films that we already had on schedule? And luckily, I think the filmmakers that we work with already um, knew that we were very serious about it. They saw all the press that ran um, when we launched it and knew it was a positive thing. And I think there's sort of a philanthropic um, feel to it too, because audiences know that, hey, my local art house cinema is in trouble and they're closed because of COVID. I can at least watch something they're sponsoring and help them out with my ticket sale. So it's a new business model. Um, we were very excited about it. Uh, we got a lot of attention for it. And also it was a way for us to expand and work with different kinds of cinema, which was exciting for me. You mentioned Kickstarter, uh, oh, yeah. earlier, where you used to work as senior communication specialist uh, from 2015 to 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, for those listening who aren't familiar with the company, uh, it's basically a, a crowdfunding platform, which allows artists to give their projects visibility and find uh, financial backers. Mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, how big of an impact do you think Kickstarter really had on financing and distribution in the arts and cinema specifically? I think Kickstarter is a really interesting company. Um, I wasn't really fully aware of the kind of money that was being raised by them when I started. Um, I just looking at their stats now, which are online, they're very transparent about their numbers. Um, as a whole, in the last, um, I think they're 10 years old now or nine years old, um, they've raised 5.8 um, billion, I think. Yeah, billion dollars. 5.8 billion dollars to art, to projects, to everything from arts and culture, to tech, to design, and out of 202,000 successful projects. So, and that's through the power of just community building and crowdfunding and um, these projects really digging in to raise the money. Um, Kickstarter makes money because they take 5% of every successfully raised project. Um, so the company, somebody has an idea um, that they want to put on Kickstarter. It really allows a lot of creative freedom for them to try 
to get something off the ground. So, you know, if, if they had a very cool idea for a tabletop game, there's tabletop games that raise millions of dollars because it's a cool, interesting idea. There's film projects that are like, I need to, you know, raise 10,000 for, you know, my short. And then sometimes those shorts go on to Sundance or, you know, they, they've they had um, Kickstarter every single year has had a film that has used the platform that has made it to be nominated for an Oscar. Um, and I think had, last year had one that won an Oscar where they used um, initial funds were raised on Kickstarter. Um, the HBO show with Issa Rae and Secure, um, way That's back in the day, Way back in the day, she didn't have a lot of money and used Kickstarter for her um, online web series, Awkward Black Girl, which got her the attention um, and the notice to eventually um, make Insecure. So there's a lot of really successful projects like that. And for film specifically, I'm looking at the numbers. Um, it's been um, $499 million dollars to film and video projects. And so my job when I was there, I was the first um, film PR person they hired. There was an art PR person that they hired um, along with me, but she left. And once she left, I kind of absorbed her role and I had to step up and really dig into what does arts and culture mean at Kickstarter and how um, does a platform help artists on a very micro level um, you know, and then it was everything from, you know, the artists starting out small to kind of establish people who would try the platform to raise money because they already had an existing um, base. Um, so I found that company really interesting. Um, they too went through some pandemic uh, woes. They had to lay off their staff, some of their staff, and they had um, some troubles in the press regarding unionizing and their, which actually their employees have unionized, which is a great thing. Um, but they're still um, on the very base level, a really amazing platform. If you're an artist trying to raise money and trying to figure it out and to use a platform like that, where um, it's very easy to outline in a video what you wanna do with your passion, how you wanna raise that money and how you want community to be involved with raising to help you get your, your art and your project, um, bring it to life. It's still a really great platform. They have a lot of resources. They have a lot, they have a lot of newsletters and, and the people that uh, still work there, I'm still friends with all the film people. The two film uh, women in film that still work there, Elise McCabe and um, Liz Cook, each of them do narrative and documentary. I went to Cannes with them because we were in Cannes trying to do meetings with different um, producers to really explain what the platform was all about, you know, and how that could work um, for their filmmakers in their respective countries. And just for awareness, you know, of how it worked in America. Um, so that was when I got to go to Cannes. I don't get to go to Cannes anymore because of budget, but when I got to go with Kickstarter, we really dug in and and a lot of people outside of America were like, what's crowdfunding? What's Kickstarter? And there are some countries that have their own platforms uh, where they support artists. Um, but that was when I met Diane, <laughs> was when I was with Kickstarter, actually. Um, I think it's quite a, a hopeful case. I mean, it just speaks a lot towards um, community building in cinema yeah. and the, the people even non-professionals people who aren't, who aren't professionals in the industry just come together to make projects happen that they're excited about i think it's a it's a wonderful success story yeah the okay the next question is a bit more of a, a vanity fair type question if i can say uh you also worked at lincoln film center which yep. organizes the new york film festival among other events uh you manage logistics for guests of the festival um, I was wondering if there were any specific uh, guests, any filmmakers or actors who, who particularly stood out for you for any reason whatsoever. Oh my gosh. I was there for four years, so everybody came through. It was like very bizarre because it's like one morning it could be Nicole Kidman and then in the evening it's like, you know, Kate Blanchett all in one day, you know, it was, it was always nonstop. And with the New York Film Festival, with all the premieres, 
it's an incredible launch pad for um, the premieres in New York. And um, there were a lot of world premieres there. So I worked with everybody and it was eye opening because to me, I don't get starstruck really. I kind of am too busy to think about that. It's like, okay, what are their needs? Are they comfortable? Are their teams comfortable? But I mean, I have to admit when I worked with George Clooney, um, he was very easy and he did a press line. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes with talent, they don't really want to do like the whole press line or they just want to do photos and they don't want to, they're just kind of in a rush, you know, which is fine. But he stood there and he talked to every single reporter Order, like every single one from like the popular one to the one at the end of the line and he looked them in the eye he answered any questions they had he was really gracious he just knew that like he was there to sort of promote the film and then he thanked me and he just was generous you know and I was kind of just a little bit wow he's he's he just knows he's just a classic Hollywood class act <laughs> You know, like he was great. Um, we worked on a gala for Barbara Streisand that was really major. I'm a big fan of hers. And I've never worked on anything on that scale. Um, President Clinton gave her an award um, called the Chaplin Award, which film at Lincoln Center every year, they give somebody really major in film an award and it's their biggest fundraiser of the year. So there was a lot of people there. She was there, Liza Minnelli performed, Tony Bennett performed. It was just kind of one of those moments that was surreal, like planning that took an entire village, you know, every detail um, for me and publicity, especially for her to feel comfortable. And um, people are always like, what was that like? And like, is she scary? And I was like, no, she wasn't. She was a joy. She and her team are very organized and I'm very organized. So it was a perfect fit, you know, like she, she came, everything was handled from top to bottom for her. She was very excited to be honored. And it was just surreal standing there backstage with her and Hillary Clinton over here and Bill Clinton over here and Catherine Zeta Jones over here. And I just kind of was like, this is like the most weird moment ever. But also I was thinking ahead, like, okay, they need to be on schedule. They need to be here next. I need to move them from this room to the next room. Um, so I think those are my favorites, but also all the international talent that I've followed for years um, came to Ho Shao Shen, um, De Pla Shen, um, you know, uh, at, for the film festival and it was really amazing it's a, you know all of the main people always came so that was but to me like some of the talent that really also stands out um, are the lesser known talent who go on to become really big like we opened Pariah by Dee Reese and I remember she came and you know she just kind of was so excited that this movie was she's like I can't believe this is playing at film at Lincoln Center and I just remember just being with her all night, hanging out, and now she's wildly, you know, has gone on. So there were a lot of filmmakers like that, that they were just so proud to be there and to have their film play at that, in their venues and then move on to bigger things. D. Reeves is the director of uh, Medbound, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Great, great movie. Yeah. Um, and out of all the film releases for which uh, that you have worked on uh, now at Kino Lorber, um, if you had to name one campaign uh, that was particularly interesting or, or special for you, either because of the challenges that it raised or maybe the way you approached it or just your per personal affinity with the movie? Oh gosh. I think there's two. One, we do restorations also. It's very important for us to really support cinema that um, either we restore or we work with other or other people, other companies have restored and we release. Um, one was called The Queen by Frank Simon. Um, people can watch it on Netflix. Um, it's about a legendary drag show that was very underground in 1969, I believe. And Andy Warhol judged it here in New York. And it was a document of that drag show. 
and um, Crystal LaBeja, who went on to found House of LaBeja, is in it, and it's a very famous pivotal scene where she doesn't win, and um, she gets really angry about it. It's it was one of these films that was kind of for me a discovery that I had seen somewhere like years ago, and the fact that oh, Kino Lorber is going to um, work on the restoration, or is, is going to work on the restoration and releasing it, release the restoration. Um, and I was really proud to work on that as somebody queer. I was just like, wow, this is a really vital document of the, from the queer community of when, you know, these men were like, had to be underground and it was illegal for them. And, you know, they had to figure out you know, the right venue to secretly do this drag show and, and Andy Warhol judged it. There was just a lot of history there. So that was one that I was really, really proud of. And, um, you know, I think the others, I love all the stuff that we end up acquiring out of can because it makes me feel really good when, you know, we're able to acquire out of the festival, like something really special. So we've released, uh, uh, Cantor Balagoff's uh, Bean Pole, um, Baccarat, um, Jean Luc Godard's films, um, The Image Book. Um, that was surreal because I don't really, he doesn't do press really. So I, I was not working directly with him, but to know that I was doing the publicity for a Jean Luc Godard film, which who knows, maybe it's his last one was kind of inspiring and pretty amazing. And, you know, his films aren't for everybody. So I had to figure out how to position, you know, something like the image book um, and then with the right kind of press. Um, but I recently, the thing that really gave me a lot of joy recently, I had a film called Test Pattern uh, by a black uh, director, female director. and it didn't have much of a profile. It didn't play a lot of major festivals at all. It didn't play like the big festivals. And we watched it and we knew there was something special with it. Um, the movie centers on a black female who gets assaulted and she's trying to find a rape kit in Texas. And you know, that's a heavy subject for a lot of people. And we got the best press that I could have ever imagined. Like Rolling Stone called it a masterpiece, you know. Richard Brody at the New Yorker wrote a feature like everybody raved critic wise raved about the film because it was a new voice you know and and she's going to be huge um and she already because of the success of the press and the film opening um it made me feel good that she was like wow like you guys really knocked it out of the park like nobody really paid attention to me in this film before and now she just got signed for representation with UTA, United Talent Artists. And she's like, I'm already working on my next two films, you know, because of the support um, and being signed. And so that made, that was something that happened very fast. And I was trying to wrap my brain around it. I'm like, wow, this is a tough film to market, but it really wasn't. It really was because she made a really beautiful cinematic film that really um, spoke to a lot of the audience, you know, not even just black women, but like a lot of non uh, black people who saw it really felt immersed into the challenges that black women face. And obviously insight into what black women deal on a daily basis and how they're treated in the medical community. We did things like we showed it to nurse organizations and one of the leading nurse organizations in America put out a press release that said, you know, everyone in the medical community needs to watch this film because of um, the challenges Black women face. So things like that, I felt really, I don't even want to take credit for it, but like I felt really proud that I could help it along and get it the press and get it noticed and put it on people's radar with our, you know, Kino Lorber backing. But, you know, she, she had trouble finding distribution with this film before and nobody at the festival level really wanted to play it. And I'm really happy that we were able to step up. And to me, her film is just as important as the Cannes films that we acquire. Like it's gonna be um, watched for years to come and, and a really important, um, uh, important film um, in our library. And, and I can't wait to see what she does next. And her name's uh, Shatara Michelle Ford. So, you know, knowing that I sort of helped and touched that 
and it's gonna be the next big thing hopefully with her future films um it makes me feel what's, really good what's the name of the film again can you test pattern test, test pattern? pattern yeah okay. um you minored in women's studies at university like i did <laughs> yeah <laughs> i so care about been, women <laughs> yeah that's been going on a while and i was wondering what you think is your responsibility uh within a major distributor uh, regarding minority voices and how to promote their film and also how much leeway do you have really to to do that well so we're we're very we're small people think Kino Lorber is like really huge we're really small we're we're out of New York we don't have like an international office we don't have an LA office we're in New York and my boss is Richard Lorber he's our CEO and president and Wendy Lightbell who is our um, senior vice president. And um, we, they do the acquisition. So they go to the festivals, they look at everything, but we have the autonomy to look at films too, you know, on our theatrical team. And, you know, we can get links from the sales agents. And um, if it's festival world, um, festival time, and my bosses are at festivals, they'll, kind of look at things and be like, hey, you know, we're unsure about this. Can you look at it? We'd love to get your eye. So I really do feel very involved in the process. Um, obviously, as a company, we're very sensitive to making sure that we promote more than white men <laughs> and, uh, and look at women filmmakers who's the next big voices, look at international film. So that's the thing that I love about this job is that my day to day, I could be working on a black female film about sexual assault. The next day, it's like working on something for Jean-Luc Godard, you know, the next day it's working on um, a movie out of Mexico um, by, you know, by uh, a rising female artist. Um, so I think, uh, um, you know, women filmmakers obviously are important to us. We don't even, I think the way we look at the films, we don't even really look at, you know, capping numbers or, you know, or anything like that. We look at the film and its quality. And quite frankly, the quality of women filmmakers is astounding. There's so much out there that's amazing, you know, and, and we work with a lot of female filmmakers nonstop. So it's, it's interesting because sometimes it goes through these waves where I'm just like, oh, we've worked with a lot of dudes recently. And then now we're like, I'm in a wave where like, because of just the scheduling, like every, film on my slate is by a woman director you know and I, I and I just think it's just you know that's just happenstance it's not really planned out you know and obviously international voices are so important you know and and we want we want audiences to feel like us to feel a sense of discovery you know and so you know cinema from around the world depending on what it is you know and its subject is is, is important to us so so yeah, we look everywhere. We try to look beyond just, you know, the Cannes, the Venice, the Berlin. Um, they all have, thankfully, their curators and programmers do a really good job. But, you know, somebody like Shatara Michelle Ford, female filmmaker, Black in America, who didn't have her film in Cannes, she emailed us directly with her producer. I was like, hey, you know, I don't have a sales agent right now, but, you know, the reason why I feel like you should look at this film she listed the reasons and we saw it and we're like, wow, this is really powerful and really beautifully made. And, and, you know, there's a lot to be said about gatekeeping in this industry, especially festival gatekeeping. And, and we want to be mindful of that and not just only look to the top key festivals, but look beyond, you know, and where our blind spots might be, where can we find talent that's making noise and, we rely on our sales agents because of the volume of films out there. But, you know, we try to keep our radar and our finger on the pulse, you know, because we know that there's chances that there could be discoveries out there that don't have those resources or don't have a sales agent or don't get into like a Sundance or can. And speaking of uh, female filmmakers, um, this year at the Oscars was the first time that two women were nominated for uh, Best Director. Chloe Zhao won for Nomadland. 
and mm -hmm. uh, Emerald Fennell was uh, nominated for Promising Young Woman. Yep. Um, that might just be your, your personal opinion, but I, I was wondering, do you think this means things are, are changing uh, at the Oscars? Is there a real change or is this more of a, an exceptional year that might not happen again so soon? I mean, I think the thing with the um, Oscars and awards in general is really interesting because I think for far too long, um, they need to diversify their voters. That's very clear, you know, that's very clear in the press. Look at the Golden Globes and all the stuff that just blew up with them. They didn't even have one black writer, you know, and, and, and that's really such a blind spot. And I'm really hopeful that the award system, I go back and forth because I kind of feel like awards are awards, you know, it's like what matters is, you know, that you made this art but awards, unfortunately, are a necessity and are important for this industry. And the fact that a Chloe won, I mean, I can't imagine what that's going to do for so many women filmmakers and Asian women filmmakers to be inspired to reach. They know that they have the chance to reach that level with the film like Nomadland, which really at the base of it is about a woman, an older woman trying to find her way in the world on her journey, you know? And who would have thought that like that, you know, compared to, you know, other Hollywood things that have won um, would win, you know, it was such a special year. I mean, I think, you know, with the focus on independent cinema, which is what was being released and like a lot of big studios weren't really putting out a lot of stuff that now people can realize, wow, a Chloe Zhao Nomadland deserves to be up there next to a Titanic, you know? And, and for us, it's good because it's like, I'll never work on a film like Titanic because I'm just, that's just not the PR I do. But I work within the space where, you know, Kino Lorber released Chloe's first film, you know? And so the fact that like- Was, was that so Songs My, My Feather Taught Me? Yeah. Songs of My Brother. Um, the fact that Kino released that first, I wasn't there. It was maybe like five years ago. And that she went on to win Best Director. It's like makes us really proud that like we were at least associated with her in the beginning, you know, for her first film and distributing it. Um, so I don't think it's a fluke. I think that this there's there's audience to be had there's money to be made, there's audience, different audience to tap into. And I think sometimes Hollywood fixates on like that certain 18 to 35 year old white male. And like, they can't look at that anymore because look at some of these films that have come out recently, like Crazy Rich Asians. I remember people thinking like, well, is that gonna do well? Are people gonna go see it? Are Asian audiences gonna go see it? And that was being questioned. And then look what, what, how much money it made. It's kind of like, if you don't try to put out different kinds of work, you're, you, you're, you're not going to learn that there are, there's a hunger for different kinds of stories, you know? And, and I think I was really proud of, of this year, you know, during a pandemic year that was tough, how many, non-white people got nominated for awards and, but there's still a lot of work to do, you know, like look at the Golden Globes, like that's insane to me that there is not one black member in, in, in their voting pool and that they were kind of getting slightly defensive and, and it just blew up in their face, you know, and, and we work on awards too. We try our best. Us. We've had some documentary nominations and I worked on one nomination of Fathers and Sons. And that was a crash course for me in awards and campaigns and the logistics and the money and the networking that needs to go into a nomination. And um, a lot of that business stuff is really tricky, and, but ultimately it comes down to how powerful the film is. Finally, uh, I was, so Kino Lorber has quite the extensive um, catalog for, of classic films. Uh, I believe they include early D.W. Griffith, uh, Buster yeah. Keaton, German expressionist films. Yeah. What do you think is, is the relevance of such a catalog in the age of 
binge watching and, and platforms and how much resonance does it find with uh, today's audiences? I think what people are shocked is that we actually still have a home video business because we sell Blu-rays and DVDs and then we're constantly pumping out lots of titles, old and new. Um, we have a really kick-ass person in our staff who's a VP who negotiates a lot of this stuff because a lot of it is under vaults or under lock and key or hasn't been released in a long time and has or hasn't gotten a DVD release for years. And um, the home video business part of Kino is really healthy. Now, we're kind of like studying this, like, wow, why is this the case? Because there's the Netflix, there's the binging. Well, it's there's collectors out there. We've know, we know how to tune into collectors who love to brag about their home video. They tweet about it. They talk about it. There's home video um, reporters who sit all day long and just talk about like the quality of the Blu-ray. And, and a lot of those older movies, I mean, there's a lot of nostalgia. There's a lot of history and we want to save it. You know, we want to make sure new generations see that stuff. We released a really major um, work called Pioneers of First Women Filmmakers. And um, it was all works that we worked to restore um, from Lois Weber and Alice Guy Blachet and like all of these women that made movies that were forgotten, you know, in the early 1900s. And some of this work was, had never been seen or like was very rarely shown. We put it on into, um, a DVD Blu-ray package and it completely went viral. It went, you know, got a New York Times cover story. It was a sense of discovery for new audiences. Like, wow, these were like the pioneers of film filmmaking and they were women. And like how, you know, if you work in film and you live and eat and breathe film and you don't know about them, that's kind of a blind spot. So I think for, for some of these classic works, I think, there is an audience for it and they're hungry for it. And they realize, you know, to look at the history of cinema, it's really important to look at early works and we do really well with it actually when we release it on home video. So we're shockingly finding that there's collectors out there who still pay money to um, increase their collection. So that's part of our business aside from the theatrical releasing. Well, you're preaching to the choir. You're speaking to someone <laughs> who, who owns a huge number of DVDs still. I have to send it to you. I have to send some to you. <laughs> I can sure. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you.